I'm not crazy by Einstein's definition, doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. I expect the same results as Don Quixote. The Times to relegate the internal combustion engine to the history books? Maybe, maybe not, and maybe not completely. Is it time to replace internal combustion powered vehicles with electric vehicles? Again, maybe. Maybe not, probably not completely. Are hydrogen fuel cells or hydrogen powered internal combustion engines the answer? Again, maybe, maybe not, probably not completely. Hi, I'm Dave Droz. Welcome to my channel. I'm the talking head up in the corner of these videos. I'm a retired automotive engineer and I have a master certification in automotive technology. I have spent my entire career involved with cars. You know, the ones that use internal combustion engines. I spent most of my career in some form of technical training to the automotive industry. So please enjoy or at least endure the instructional nature of these videos. The actual objective of the discussion in this video is to let to set the stage for the big reveal of my current project. And I give you a hint, it should noticeably improve the thermal efficiency of the internal combustion engine. So stay tuned until the end for the big reveal. Okay, enough about me, let's get into the interesting stuff. Okay, when I was in school, a professor stated that an internal combustion engine is only 20 or 25 percent thermally efficient. If one could double that, they could change the world. This has stuck with me most of my career. The unfortunate thing is that in the past 50 years, that level of, of efficiency has not changed much. What that means is an IC engine's purpose is to convert heat into mechanical energy. Thus, an IC is a heat engine. We'll talk more about that later. Okay. So from a scientific point of view, they are not very good at what they do. But in the real world, they have proved to be invaluable for the last hundred plus years. Steam engines can be more efficient, but power density, which is how much power they produce for their size and weight, and their range, and their startup time, and their maintenance requirements, and other factors meant that IC engines quickly replaced them for transportation applications. <clears throat> Howard Hughes ventured into producing a steam-powered car during his career. Uh, when a prototype was shown to him, it had condensers everywhere to recover the steam and turn it back into water and reuse. Sounded great. Then even they even had condensers in the doors. Howard picked up a pickaxe and said, imagine this is a Model T Ford flying through an intersection. And he hit the door with the axe. And as you can imagine, scalding steam went everywhere. Not good. He said, scrap it, and walked away. And that was the end of that, okay? On the other hand, ICs worked well for aircraft applications, but soon reached their limitations. The higher you go, the thinner the air. ICs need close to 14.7 to one air fuel ratio. At some point, there isn't enough oxygen. Forced induction, which is superchargers and turbochargers help, but piston engines can only turn so fast, and you can only turn a propeller so fast anyway before it cavitates. Piston engine aircraft are never going to propel planes beyond Mach 1. So, even though jet engines are horribly less efficient than ICs, they soon replace them. Point being, efficiency isn't everything. Back to the challenge, can the thermal efficiency of ICs be improved? I've pondered this for many years and spent untold hours experimenting, and the 
Places that has led me will be the topic of this series of videos. Before we can discuss the question of efficiency of the internal combustion engine any further, we need to talk about the elephant in the room. The consumer cares about the efficiency of their car, but the power brokers of the world, big oil, OPEC, are happier the more petroleum vehicles consume. It's the golden rule. The ones with the gold make the rules. So, the real issue with ICs is not efficiency. It's the fuel we use in them. Henry Ford really intended for the Model T to run on ethanol. He grew up on a farm and felt that that would be great for the farmers. But as with any startup company, cash is king. And he was introduced to J.P. Morgan, who was heavily invested in John D. Rockefeller, also known as Standard Oil or Exxon. And 120 years later, here we are. I will occasionally refer to a vehicle I called the Lab Rat. It was a 1987 Ford Festiva. I used the poor thing for many experiments. I've run it on E85, which is 85% ethanol, on wood gas, a synthetic gas made from partially combusted organic materials, such as wood, paper, etc. I plan a video on that at some point. I run it on uh, green hydrogen, and that's hydrogen produced by electrolysis of water. I run it on HHO, a gas made by decomposing water. I plan at least one video on that. I've experimented at great length with that for over 20 years. It will also be incorporated into my current project and also ran it on a synthetic gas produced by decomposing aluminum in sodium hydroxide, making mostly hydrogen. I have no idea what else all was in it, but it could I could produce it as fast enough to run the lab rat directly on it. Okay, let me tilt one more windmill, then we can move on. Those who would relegate the IC to the 20th century cannot deny the paradigms that have evolved around the internal combustion engine over the last 100 plus years. We've built our lives around the freedom that comes with being able to live in the suburbs, commute to work, refuel in three minutes, tour the world, and let ICs do our heavy lifting. Antagonists of the IC can only fault it on the damage it's done to the environment. Wait for it. This is a result of the fuel, not the engine design. As we ponder the fate of the petroleum-powered internal combustion engine, let's consider the players on the field that could replace it. Wearing the number one, electric vehicles, known also as EVs. At this point in their evolution, they are broken down into battery electric vehicles, referred to as BEVs, and hybrid electric vehicles referred to as HEVs. We'll discuss them further later in this video. Okay, and wearing the number two, hydrogen fuel cells. At this point in development, a fuel cell through a chemical process generates electricity. We will discuss them as well at a later point in this video. Okay, wearing the number three, hydrogen-fueled internal combustion engines. And a subset of them, supplemental hydrogen in a hydrocarbon-fueled IC, and not necessarily dinosaur juice. NASA has done some research on this concept with interesting results. This is where 
My current project has led me and will be part of ongoing videos. Before we can discuss the opportunities for the future of the internal combustion engine, we need to understand the, some things about them. It can be described as an internal combustion heat engine, meaning it uses the heat of combustion to do work. Okay, most people think they work by fuel exploding in the cylinder, causing a shock wave that forces the piston down. If that were true, our commute would look more like this. Actually, combustion, the dynamic at work here, implies a burn. For the sticklers who will respond that explosions can be a rapid burn, humor me for the sake of discussion, okay? Wikipedia, which is Webster's Dictionary for the 21st century, defines combustion as a high temperature, exothermic, redox chemical reaction between a fuel, the reductant, and an oxidant, usually atmospheric oxygen, that produces oxidized, often gaseous products in a mixture termed as smoke. So, exothermic means it gives off heat. Redox means heat started by the spark plug or the heat of compression in a diesel breaks down the fuel, in this case, dinosaur juice, chemically, and combines it with oxygen from air. Air is about 20% oxygen. The products of this process are usable heat and smoke which in this case is exhaust, which is a mess of chemicals that we must deal with. Getting back to what actually forces the piston down, air is about 78% nitrogen, N2. The heat of the exothermic process expands the nitrogen in the air charge in the cylinder. The expanding nitrogen in the contained cylinder forces the piston down. That's why we call it internal combustion and why we call it a heat engine. Heat actually does the work. Ben Franklin, a wise man and one of the founding fathers of the United States, created, used, and shared a simple decision-making process he called the Franklin T. I think our discussion is a good application of this tool. First, let's consider the pros of the petroleum-fueled internal combustion engine. It's very well understood technology. Untold numbers of engineers have developed over nearly 150 years. The bulk of the effort has been in the automotive industry. Integral to the status quo and people don't like change. The supporting infrastructure is in place. Fueling facilities, repair and maintenance facilities and technicians are available to meet the demands. Repair parts are a huge industry and there's no added burden to the power grid. I see this as a conundrum for the other competing technologies, another elephant in the room. Highest power density of the competing technologies. Much smaller footprint on the vehicle than EVs or hydrogen-fueled cells. Uh, EV batteries have evolved to the point that they are an integral part of the vehicle structure. The size and weight of hydrogen tanks will have demands on cabin space and suspension components. Less complexity. Computers will be part of any future technology, but ICs are a self-contained system. Okay, let's look at the cons. Environmental impact. This is the big one. As per the wiki definition of combustion mentioned earlier, burning fossil fuels combines molecules from the fuel with molecules from the air. And the byproducts, such as carbon monoxide, a deadly gas resulting from incomplete combustion, carbon dioxide, which is believed to be eating the ozone layer, 
which is a shield to protect the Earth's surface from the sun's harmful ultraviolet radiation. Nitrous oxides, or NOx, a group of nasty compounds formed by combining nitrogen and oxygen. We'll, we'll talk about that a little more later. We are running out of cheap oil. In the 1950s, a geologist named Hubert did an exhaustive study on the subject and predicted we would run out of oil by the first decade of the 21st century. This has proved to be accurate on the basis of the sources he considered in the 50s. But technology has advanced in the past 70 plus years. Things such as GPR or ground penetrating radar, which leads to things like fracking and horizontal drilling and other technologies are finding new sources every day, but they don't come cheap. With prices at the pump, what they are today, we find alternative energy sources more and more attractive. Oil will price itself out of relevance before we run out. Sheikh Ahmed Zahai Yamani, the longtime Saudi oil minister and a key founder of OPEC, has perhaps summed up the world oil market best. He said, the Stone Age came to an end, not for lack of stones, and the oil age will end, but not for lack of oil. Next, let's discuss electric vehicles. I must mention here that for the purposes of this discussion, this group includes pure electric vehicles defined as vehicles that rely on battery power only and require some level of a charging station and electrified vehicles, which includes everything else that uses electric power. Chevrolet notes that the term electrified covers all vehicles that use electric power at varying stages, such as e-assist, hybrid, plug-in hybrid, extended range electric vehicles. Now let's discuss the pros of this group of vehicles. Okay, first of all, the rapidly increasing availability. This technology is already on the ground and growing exponentially. CNBC quotes Ford CEO Jim Farley as Ford plans to increase its production capacity of electric vehicles to 600,000 units globally by 2023. GM declares himself all in and is right behind them. Tesla can't build them fast enough. Okay, now they provide users a pleasant driving experiences. Vehicles powered by an electric motor operate smoothly, operate so quietly that some states have laws requiring noise generating technology at low speeds. Okay, quick acceleration. Electric motors provide maximum torque at zero shaft speed, making them typically capable of out accelerating uh, an IC powered vehicle. Okay, simplified driveline. Pure electrics require only a direct connection to the driveline. There's no intermediate gear reduction required. This permits the possibility of attaching the motor directly at the wheels. And of course there are some cons. Not as environmentally friendly as presented, our power grid depends on coal-fired plants which are horribly more polluting than ICs. And in their current tune, wind and solar are unreliable and will need a network of storage capacities that are still a gleam in the scientists' eyes. Ideas like using wind and solar to pump water back into reservoirs make sense, but when and where? Nuclear is the hope of the EV industry, but again, where and when? No one wants them in their backyard. And are humans capable of using nuclear power for strictly peaceful means? Just a question. Unsustainable impact on the power grid. 
the power grid in the U.S. is already maxed out and marginal. Brownouts and rolling blackouts are already required to manage peak loads. It needs to be hardened against terrorists and enemies of the state by technology that probably doesn't exist yet. Imagine everyone wanting to recharge their vehicle in the evening, which is already peak demand. And charging times. Fast charging a battery will not usually give you full capacity. Charging stations are rated at different levels. For example, a 30 minute charge on level two to a Nissan Leaf might get you five and a half miles. I was in the service station business in 1973 during the oil embargo, and this conjures up visions of even longer lines than I saw then. Okay, range. Okay, published ranges for different vehicles for ideal charge times and ideal driving conditions. A law of physics known as Pukert's Law that has not yet been broken says that discharge rates are impacted by battery or do impact battery capacity. Lithium ion batteries are debatably less subject to it than lead acid batteries, but it is still the law. Government subsidies. The U.S. and other countries provide tax credits and other incentives to encourage EV sales, but that well will eventually go dry. Battery issues. Battery technology is in a state of flux. In the foreseeable future, lithium ion technology seems to be prevailing. The world supply of lithium is much more finite than petroleum reservoirs. And at this point, recycling viability is questionable. Future wars may be fought over, may be fought over lithium. At this point in the discussion, I must remind everyone that I am presenting questions, not answers. Don't shoot the messenger. Next, let's discuss hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. Again, Wikipedia defines a fuel cell vehicle or fuel cell electric vehicle is an electric vehicle that uses a fuel cell, sometimes in combination with a small battery or supercapacitor to power its onboard electric motor. Fuel cells in vehicles generate electricity, generally using oxygen from the air and compressed hydrogen. Most fuel cell vehicles are classified as zero emissions vehicles that emit only water and heat. Let's discuss the pros of fuel cell electric vehicles. First, low well-to-wheels greenhouse gas emissions. This graph says it all. Centralized hydrogen production from natural gas with sequestration, which is long-term storage of carbon in plants, soils, geologic formations, and the ocean, is being done now and is scalable. Wind, biomass, even coal are better methods of producing hydrogen, but have issues of their own. The U.S. is sitting on large reserves of natural gas. If you scrape off the propaganda, the Ukraine war is about natural gas. Maybe the Russians know something, huh? The U.S. Geological Service estimates that it has 3,000 metric gigatons of carbon dioxide storage available in the U.S. Don't know what a metric gigaton is, but I'm pretty sure I couldn't lift it. Geoengineering techniques such as returning it to the soil are infinite. Plants take in CO2 and give off oxygen. Minimal social impact. Hydrogen fuel cells can fit comfortably within the lifestyle we have grown accustomed to. Refueling in under five minutes and 300 mile plus range, Toyota is betting heavily on fuel cell electric vehicles. 
and is by far the most dialed into the socioeconomic car manufacturer and has changed the paradigm before. Remember the Prius. Okay, abundant, inexpensive fuel. Hydrogen is the most abundant element on the planet, in fact, in the universe. Water is two-thirds hydrogen. The only byproduct of a fuel cell is water, so it should be an infinite source and should not alter the ecosystem like dinosaur juice. Also, most plant life is hydrocarbon compound. It should be inexpensive, but remember the golden rule. Fermi, the father of nuclear energy, predicted that nuclear power would make electricity so cheap it would not be worth billing for it. We know how that went. Okay, let's talk about the cons. Fear of the word hydrogen. People associate the word hydrogen with the hydrogen bomb, conjuring up images of the Hindenburg, nuclear holocaust, radiation burns, etc. The only reason hydrogen we use for the first H-bombs is the fact that hydrogen atom is the simplest atom, thus the easiest to split. Nuclear fission sooner moved on to plutonium and other elements. Technology has now moved on to nuclear fusion, but still leaving hydrogen with a bad rap. But if you think 10 or 20 gallons of gasoline on board in a sheet metal tank isn't dangerous, ask Ford about Pintos or GM about their 70s Chevy pickups. Hydrogen tanks, by virtue of needing to hold thousands of PSI pressure, make them magnitude stronger than sheet metal tanks and so much safer. It requires energy and feedstock to produce. Hydrogen can be produced by many different methods. They have been coded by color one through nine based on different variations of process and feedstock. Unfortunately, most hydrogen produced today is done by some form of methane reforming, requiring extracting methane from natural gas. Methane, which is CH4, contains a carbon atom. So we're back to that. Electrolysis on the other end of the color spectrum is the most efficient since it eliminates several steps in the process, but it does not scale well and is a slower process. A process is being developed currently which extracts carbon from a powder format which can easily be managed. Finally, let's talk about the pros and cons of hydrogen-fueled internal combustion engines. They carry all the same fuel production issues as fuel cell vehicles, but have a few considerations of their own. Pundits of hydrogen fuel cells say that using electricity to make hydrogen, then turning it back into electricity doesn't sound too smart. Elon Musk calls them fool cells, to which one could say, how smart does using electricity to turn lithium into lithium ions while adding nearly a ton of batteries to the vehicle weight, then turn the ions back into usable electricity sound? They're both methods of energy storage, but making but it makes using electricity to make hydrogen, then turning it into usable work in an internal combustion engine kind of makes sense by that criteria. Huh. As I say, that's when the fight broke out. Okay, let's look at the pros. Simplest solution. Occam's razor says the simplest solution is usually the most elegant. Converting ICs to hydrogen would have virtually no negative impact on society. Okay, economic economies of scale 
could, and I say could, bring prices in line with gasoline. Again, remember the golden rule. Also, engine manufacturers could reboot with minimal time and cost. Okay, the aftermarket conversion industry. ICs can be converted quite easily to use hydrogen. I have induced hydrogen into IC several ways. None of them elegant, but simple. I am in the process of developing an injector that uses the EGR port. Another hint to the reveal, okay? This would be invaluable to billions of people already invested in their gasoline ICs and would accelerate the reduction of the global carbon footprint. This would be a boon to the over-the-road trucking industry. Owner-operators are typically heavily invested in their truck and expect a million miles out of it. Converting diesels to hydrogen is not as simple as gas-powered vehicles, but it is being done. Yeah. Hydrogen adapts well to internal combustion process. Guess we need to discuss the internal combustion process at this point. Assuming you understand the four-stroke cycle, since you're still with me, air and fuel are induced into the cylinder on the intake stroke, the com then compressed on the compression stroke, resulting in a hot compressed charge of air and fuel at or near the ideal or stoichiometric ratio of 14.7 to 1, followed by the combustion stroke, where a spark is introduced, starting the combustion process. Remember, as I mentioned before, the goal here is to heat the nitrogen, which is 75 or 78 percent of the air in the charge as much as possible, expanding it. At this point, many things come into play. First, we don't want the flame front to travel too erratically because uneven expansion and contracting the cooled cylinder walls, quenching the combustion. Okay. Also, we want as much heat as possible to gain the most expansion out of the nitrogen. But that brings a limitation. Nitrogen will combine with oxygen at about 2300 degrees Fahrenheit. In other words, it'll burn. Nitrogen combusts violently. Think of nitroglycerin and results in detonation, often called ping or spark knock. This is hard on the engine, but also results in nitrous oxides or NOx, okay, the main ingredient in photochemical smog. Also, the combustion process proceeds down the cylinder. It reaches a point where the oxygen left is insufficient to sustain the process but there is oxygen and fuel left. In the case of carbon-based fuels, this results in a partially oxidized carbon or carbon monoxide, which is readily combined with the remaining oxygen, resulting in carbon dioxide, the villain in this story. In modern engines, this is managed fairly well by feedback from an oxygen sensor and secondary combustion in a catalytic converter. Okay, this brings us to some cons. Nitrous oxides or smog is still possible. Remember, the combustion process is the same, so there is still nitrogen in the air. But remember, we can tune that out of a hydrocarbon-fueled engine, and probably tuned hydrogen IC would also address this problem. Okay, it lowers volumetric efficiency. Gaseous hydrogen is very low density, so it occupies much more space on the air fuel charge. The stoichiometric ratio is 34 to 1, meaning it will replace some gasoline vapor, leaving room for less oxygen and nitrogen. However, the octane rating of hydrogen is 130 plus, so 
it will tolerate a much higher compression ratio. A typical gasoline engine tuned to meet today's emission standards has around about an 8 to 1 compression ratio. By raising the ratio to 15 to 1, a 47 to 56 percent improvement in efficiency has been achieved. Toyota claims that with no consideration for cost, 60 percent is achievable. This puts us right up there with fuel cells at 64 percent. Hmm. Finally, it's time for the big reveal. Hopefully, by this point, I have laid the groundwork thoroughly. This diagram is a graphic illustration of the ideas. As I mentioned several times, the fact that IC engines are only 25 to 30 percent efficient when they are such an elegant concept has always troubled me. The question is simple. It's a heat engine. Where is the other 70 or 75 percent of the heat going? The answer is also simple. It's going out through the exhaust and the cooling system. <clears throat> the elephant in this room is, why has no one seriously addressed it in 125 years? Again, the golden rule. My objective is to make as much improvement as possible with very limited resources, with basic engineering skills in my backyard workshop. <clears throat> Don Quixote has been gone for 500 years, and windmills are more popular than ever. But everyone still knows he tilted them. I plan a detailed video of this concept as it goes along, but here it is in a nutshell. Heat from the exhaust stroke which can easily reach 450 or 500 degrees Fahrenheit, travels to a chamber with a coil of tubing inside, essentially creating a flash boiler. Then the exhaust drives a turbocharger, which supplies air, containing oxygen, to the flash boiler chamber, inducing secondary combustion, as in a catalytic converter raising the temperature to as much as a thousand degrees Fahrenheit, and by the way, breaking down more hydrocarbon. Water from a feed tank passes through the tubing quickly, turning it into steam. The steam travels to a Briggs and Stratton engine converted to run on steam. A video of that is coming. The steam exhausting from the engine goes to a condensing process and is pumped back to the feed water tank. The steam engine turns an alternator, charging a battery. This has merit on its own by taking the load off of the IC, but there is more to the story. Electrical energy is available to power an electrolyzer, generating green hydrogen, also with no added load on the IC, which will be used to supplement the hydrocarbon fuel in the IC. Supplemental hydrogen has been established as value by many, including myself. NASA did some research on this and produced some impressive numbers. The reason this technology has never seen the light of day is the first law of thermodynamics, meaning you will never get more energy out than you put in. But what if you use otherwise wasted energy? I also plan to supplement the battery charge with regenerative braking, more wasted energy, to offset the vehicle electrical overhead. Work is well underway on a platform to test these ideas. The plan is to build a lightweight three-wheel test vehicle designed around the concepts and incorporating some chassis design ideas I've pondered as well. It's a replacement for the lab rat and will be called Occam's Razor for obvious reasons. Projected curb weight should be around 1,200 pounds or 545 kilograms. So the 1,300cc four-cylinder I have installed out of a Ford Aspire should be adequate. The chassis is nearly complete and I have removed the engine to complete some welding and set up the engine. 
I plan a video on the chassis design and build, so stay tuned. I've assembled an engine management system as well. It's an open architecture and is fully programmable, which should allow me to tune the system to optimize blending the two fuels. There are some extra outputs which hopefully will allow me to control the heat recovery system as well. It's shown here working on the simulator, so it should be good. I have even added a distributorless ignition system from a Ford Escort called an EDIS-4. Why? Because it didn't have a distributor, and they work very well. I'm working on a video on that as well. They can be adapted to pretty much anything that needs a spark ignition. Works quite well. Thank you for visiting Dad's Garage. Hopefully you've enjoyed this video and gained some insight. It represents a lifetime of accumulated information I'm glad to share. If you would like a transcript of this video, I will make it available to subscribers to my channel who request it in the comments section. At this point, I plan videos on implementing and tuning the engine management system, Finding and configuring the EDIS-4 distributorless ignition system. The heat recovery system discussed on this video, probably several. HHO electrolyzer development. Running an internal combustion engine on wood gas. Hydrogen from decomposing aluminum. Even a three-quarter scale 32 Ford Roadster I built from scratch with what I call obtainium. Let me know in the comments which one you are most interested in, and I will use them to prioritize development of the oncoming videos. Again, thanks for watching. Please subscribe.